pimping during surgery. What is it? Why does it happen? And what are my experiences with pimping during surgery? In this video today, we're going to talk about that. What's up, everyone? This is Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. You don't want to miss them. So, pimping during surgery. Pimping is just a fancy medical term for asking someone a question and putting them on the spot. It happens all throughout medical school, all throughout your training. As a physician, you will be pimped. And it's not the pimp that you're thinking, wearing a pimp hat and, a yeah. and walking around and pimping. It's actually just asking questions. You're being asked questions to make sure that you understood the material that you read and that you're prepared for that particular portion of medicine. And whether you are a nursing student, physical therapy student, chiropractic student, resident, fellow, you will get pimped during your medical training. Someone is gonna ask you a question like, hey, what is the side effect of allopurinol? Or what structure is this that we're pointing to right here? And what happens if we cut this structure? So I've been pimped a lot throughout my medical training and it's actually a good thing for me because it allows me to figure out what I don't know, what I do know, and it actually motivates me to go home and study because if I'm asked a question in surgery or in a big lecture hall with 40 people there and then Dr. Webb, what does the research say about anticoagulation use after a total hip replacement? And if I don't know the answer to that, that puts me on the spot, makes me realize like, hey, I need to go home and read about this. Some people actually abuse pimping. They will pimp to the death of you. They will ask you questions. What is this? What is this? Bam, 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 bam. To make sure that you are going home every night that you're reading, that you are studying the material every night. Some people don't like it. Everybody learns in a different way. Some people just don't learn that way. But over my kind of medical training, I actually have come to like it and I enjoy it because it picks out things that I just don't know. So we're gonna talk about a medical procedure in spine surgery, it's called a lateral interbody fusion, which means we place the patient on their side in surgery and we access the spine that way. I recently had one of these cases here in fellowship and the staff that I was with, who's a spine surgeon, pimped me throughout the whole entire case. I'm going to tell you guys some of the questions that he asked me and just to give you an idea of what questions are these surgeons asking you in surgery. So when it comes time for you guys to rotate during your surgery rotation or as a resident medical student, you can say, hey, I have an idea of what questions they're asking. So we're gonna jump right to the video. So when we come into the operating room, there are several people in the operating room. There's a operating room technician, there's an anesthesia technician, there's the anesthesiologist who together put the patient to sleep, put a breathing tube in them. There is the sales rep who helps us with the implants and the parts of the surgery. And then there's the surgical team, including the surgeon as well as the fellow or resident or medical student. So when we first come into the room, we position the patient like this here. Uh, the patient is turned on their side. There are many different ways that we can access the spine. We can go from the patient's side, we can go through their neck, we can go th behind their neck, we can go through their belly, we can go through their back. So this procedure, the lateral interbody fusion, uh, means that we have the patient turned to their side in surgery, as you can see here, and then we do the surgery by making an incision on the side of the patient. We tape them down to the bed in surgery so that they don't move. You can see the tape here. We drape them out in a sterile fashion and then we make our incision. So this is the iliac crest here, portion of the bone of the pelvis. And before we actually make our incision, we're gonna make sure that we do the surgery on the correct level. So in the lumbar spine, there's L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Well, if a patient doesn't have any symptoms from a particular level, we don't do that level in surgery. So say for instance, we're doing the L4, L5 level, 
Well, the patient may have some symptoms in the L5 distribution, which means at the top of their foot, they may have some weakness and picking up their foot or picking up their big toe. So we're just marking out the area where we'll make our incision here. So the first question that I was actually asked was, um, once we made our incision, what is this structure here? So the structures that you have to know are your external obliques as well as your rectus abdominis, the muscle layers, the external obliques go like this, like you're putting your hands in the pocket. Your internal obliques go the opposite way. The fibers run the opposite way. And then you have your transverse abdominis. And then below that is your peritoneum. So you have to know your anatomy. That's why it's important to always review your anatomy the, the night before or before a case to prepare for the surgery because you have to know what is what, what structures to avoid, and how to properly perform the surgery. So that was the first question that I uh, was asked, hey, what is this structure here? And it was actually the external oblique. We had to make an incision and go through that muscle to get down to the spine. So we were going down, make an incision. We went through the external oblique. We went through the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. And then we were down to the fascia. So there's the transverse abdominis and then the peritoneum. And you can see in the top picture on your right here, there is the spine, I see the aorta, the red structure, as well as the blue structure, which is the inferior vena cava, I see the bowels, I see the kidney. So all those structures are pretty close to where we are performing this surgery. And that's a pretty similar route that we take to get down to the spine. This is a little bit different, it's called a OLIF, which means oblique lateral interbody fusion. A lateral is actually going straight down, going through the psoas muscle, and then getting down to the spine. Some very important structures that are right in front of the spine. That's why I say it's important to know your anatomy. One of the structures that I was asked, as um, soon as we got down pretty close to the spine, the surgeon that I was working with, he said, hey, what is that structure right there? He pointed to it. Whenever you don't know an answer or you're, you're thinking about it, just think out loud. You can say, oh, this structure looks like a blood vessel, or it looks like a nerve, or it looks like um, something that is soft. You can maybe ask, hey, can I touch it? Can I feel it? They would probably say no. <laughs> but um, just think out loud and say, oh, this is a red, really tendinous, or a white tendinous structure. It's probably a tendon. Maybe it's the crux of the diaphragm. So I was actually asked that question as well. Um, so the structure that he pointed to is the ureter that transports urine from the kidney to the bladder and then to the urethra. So the way you can tell that that is the ureter, if you kind of barely touch it, it will peristalse, which means there's a little movement, kind of like a little worm that lets you know that that's the ureter. Because if you injure that, the patient can have a collection of urine in the surgical sites and come back to your clinic and then there's urine coming out of the wound. So you have to be very careful that you find the ureter that you protect it. The next structures that we got down to, the next question that he asked me was, um, so if this structure here is damaged, what will happen in the recovery room? A pretty common question that I've, I've actually been pimped on before as a resident and it was actually the sympathetic chain. So if you injure the sympathetic chain, the nurses may call you in the recovery room and say, hey, this patient's leg is cold. When someone's leg is cold in the post-operative period, we get concerned of a vascular injury, which means the patient is not getting enough blood down to their foot. But if you injure the sympathetic chain, it will make one leg feel cooler because the vessels cannot constrict the blood in the lower portion of the legs and the blood just pulls. So that leg actually feels warmer. The other leg feels cooler. So it's a little complicated, but if you injure the sympathetic chain, one leg can feel cooler. The other leg can feel warmer. And it's actually the warmer leg that is actually the sympathetic chain on that side is actually injured. So you have to be cautious of that and protect that structure. So another question that I've gotten, not in this case, but a 
case prior to this is the structures that were right in front of the spine, and that is the aorta and the inferior vena cava. And if you are off to anterior or your retractor is off to posteriorly, that's a bad thing. So you have to be in a very specific place when you dock your instrument so you can actually get down to the correct level and to the correct portion of the spine. So the question was, what is this structure here? It was basically the aorta. And if you, we went to anterior, we could have hit that aorta. That's a problem. You have to flip the patient on their back, have a approach surgeon open the belly and then find where that vessel is torn and repair it. And patient can lose a lot of blood. So here's just showing retractors that we use to mobilize those vessels. If we are doing a O-lift, which is an oblique lateral interbody fusion, like I said before, usually it's just going down straight through the psoas muscles and then getting down to the spine. We don't have to move the vessels out of the way, just doing a lateral fusion that way. We get our retractors in and we're, we're down to the spine. You can see the two vertebrae there and the white structure is the intervertebral disc. So once we're actually down to the spine, we dock our retractors and then we start removing the uh, discs here. This is the disease disc that we remove from the patient and then eventually this will be replaced by a device, either metal or plastic, that we put into the space to jack that space open. You can see the spine there kind of being jacked open. That's to relieve pressure on the nerves, and it's called indirect decompression, which means we indirectly decompress those nerves. You can see before and after there. Some people, sometimes when you rupture a structure called the anterior longitudinal ligament, that white long structure right there in the front, you have to put a plate or sometimes screws into the bones there to stabilize it because the anterior longitudinal ligaments is a stabilizing structure. You don't want that graft to spit out into the front where the vessels are, the aorta and the IVC. So that was actually a question that I got. Hey, what happens if we cut this structure here? It was the anterior longitudinal ligament. After the case is done, we get some x-rays to make sure that everything looks fine. And then we close the uh, wound with some sutures and put a dressing over it. The patient's woken up and taken to the recovery room. So pimping during surgery is pretty common, especially as a medical student, as a resident, and even as a fellow, I still get pimped. This is their last chance to make sure that I really know my information. And when I prepare for cases, I go through the steps of the surgery into my head and I ask myself, what structures will be in the way? What do I need to look out for? Like the nerves or the blood vessels or important structures that we have to protect. And what happens when complications arise? What happens if we accidentally tear a hole in the ureter? What do we need to do? So you need to be prepared for those things as a person on your surgery rotation, as a surgery resident, or as a surgeon. So I hope you guys learned something from this video. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. We'll see you next time.